Okay, there are three basic ways to improve functioning that requires executive functions. One is to work directly on improving executive functions, to train them, to practice them, to challenge them. A second way is to work on reducing things that impair executive functions, like stress or lack of sleep or loneliness, and I'll talk about these a lot more tomorrow. So one way to have you show better executive functions is simply to have you be less stressed. Uh, mirac mirac miraculously, if you're less stressed, you're gonna look a whole lot smarter. <laughs> um, and, and a third way to help you function better uh, on executive function tasks is to give you ways to reduce the demands of executive function. Executive function is very effortful, it's very energy demanding. So whenever you can make life easier for yourself, you should. There's no, um, nothing to be um, embarrassed about that you write yourself lists instead of trying to hold in mind everything you have to do. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, you put things that are fattening out of view so you don't have to work so hard not to eat them. That's, there's nothing wrong about that. We should make life as easy for ourselves as we can so we have the energy to do other things. So minimizing executive function demands is perfectly fine. Okay, many different activities have been tried for improving executive functions. Computerized training, games, aerobics, traditional martial arts, yoga, mindfulness, and certain school curricula. Um, and I've done a few reviews of this. Our first review came out in Science in 2011. Then this year, a review came out in another journal. And we have a big extensive review coming out in an Oxford University Press book. This review coming out is the first to look at all the different methods for trying to prove executive function and in all the different ages, not just in children or just in older people. Okay, what we didn't look at are studies that are only correlational, that only show an association, because if you show an association, you don't know what caused what. You don't know if A caused B or B caused A or some C affected both. Uh, another thing we required is that there be a comparison group. If you improved, we have no idea whether what we did caused your improvement unless we have a comparison group that didn't improve as much as you. Then we can say, well, maybe what we did is the reason why you improved so much. <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of studies, especially for physical activity, look at your exercising once and then seeing how much improvement in cognition there was. We don't know what to make of that in terms of what you do regularly, so we didn't include any study that just looked at one instance of something and its immediate effects. And of course, we required that the study look at executive functions. The evidence shows that the most successful approach thus far for improving working memory is CogMed. It's a computerized uh, working memory training that you have to pay for. However, a recent randomized controlled trial of CogMed with, four, with over 450 first graders found that while working memory improvement was still robust one year after they did CogMed, that improvement was no longer present two years later. It faded out. And those who had trained on CogMed actually performed worse in math two years later than the other kids who received regular classroom teaching while their peers did CogMed. Okay, the purpose of improving working memory is so that your math and reading can get better. If your math gets worse, that's not a good thing. Sometimes the reason something works is completely different from what anyone expected. CogMed's the most heavily researched computerized training method for improving working memory. Although most studies of CogMed don't mention the mentoring component, to be certified to administer CogMed, adults have to get trained in and commit to mentoring the kids doing CogMed. And a researcher in the Netherlands has found that it's the mentoring component that seems to account for the benefits of CogMed rather than the computerized games that they're so proud of. 
The evidence shows that the most successful approaches thus far for improving inhibitory control are school curricula and early childhood school programs that are add-ons to the curriculum. Tools of the Mind, an early childhood program based on the theories of Vygotsky and Luria, is one of the two curricula that's been shown to improve executive functions. And I've studied this one. I'll show you some of our results. Key aspects of the Tools of the Mind curriculum are the importance of, oh, Tools of the Mind is only for preschool and kindergarten. It doesn't go past kindergarten. Is the importance of play and hands-on learning and the critical importance of improving self-regulation self-control and being able to pay attention. Um, and Vygotsky emphasized the importance of social dramatic play for developing executive functions. And if you think about it, let's say you're playing cops and robbers. You have to remember what role you picked and what role your friends picked, right? Because if you're planning the robbery, you don't want to accidentally tell the cop. I mean, that would be terrible. You have to remember who's who. Um, you have to inhibit acting out of character. So if you're doing a family scenario and you're the baby in the scenario, you can't all of a sudden get up and drive the fancy family car. You have to stay in character. And your friends may take that scenario in ways you never imagined. So on the fly, in real time, you have to flexibly adapt to where the scenario's going. So even though you're playing, you're working inhibitory control, working memory, and cognitive flexibility. And many of you have probably noticed that when kids are playing, they can um, behave at a level so much better than when they're just ordinary life, right? If they pretend that they're a student who pays great attention, while they're playing the student who pays great attention, they can pay great attention. It's just when they're not in that role, they don't. Um, uh, also, tools is based on the conviction that cognitive development advances most when social and emotional development are also nurtured. The tools approach is individualized, so children receive support at their own unique developmental level, and each child can proceed in his or her own wa way at his or her own rate. So our, our first study of um, tools came out in science in 2007. And we use the hearts and flowers test. So here's a little kindergartner doing it. And what we found is on the flower block, the kids in tools, whether they had one year or two years, performed better than the control kids, significantly better. OK, so statistics tells you there's a difference. But notice that the difference is between like 70% correct and like 80 or 82% correct. It's not a, an important difference. It's statistically significant, but practically insignificant. It doesn't matter. If you look at the mixed block, though, now you see a difference that's not only statistically significant, but you can see with the naked eye. It matters in real life. The kids in the control condition very rarely could do the mixed condition at all. We also did a selective attention test where when the stimuli are pink, you're told to focus on the inside shape. So here, pressing the circle would be the right answer. And when the stimuli are blue, you're supposed to focus on the outside shape. So now the right answer is triangle, OK? And uh, the blue was the reverse. So first you start looking at the inside, and then you reverse to the outside. And what we found is on the reverse block, the control kids are a chance but the kids and tools are up at 85% correct. Again, that's a difference you can see with the naked eye. It was a big difference. And whether children were in tools or not accounted for more variation in executive functions than age or gender. And executive functions strongly predicted the academic performance. Clancy Blair and Sibel Raver have done a much more recent assessment of tools of the mind in a different, totally different community. This is in Massachusetts, their work. And what they found is the kids in tools did better on working memory, executive function response time, um, random, uh, 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 automated reading, and uh, math and reading. Um, these are effect sizes. So zero is no effect, 
And then these are different effect sizes. So where it's a star, it was a significant effect. I'm going to come back to this a, a little bit later. School curricula empirically shown to improve executive functions are only so far Montessori and tools of the mind. There may be others, it's just these are the two that have been studied and shown to have evidence. By looking at what they have in common, maybe we can learn something about what elements might be important in early education. Both programs challenge children to improve executive functions. They practice them and, and, and challenge them. They scaffold kids. They never embarrass them. In fact, Maria Montessori said, um, if you embarrass a child, it's going to go into a shell. Never correct a child. So she was really extreme in this. Um, uh, both programs have hands-on learning. And um, Montessori uses it to much older ages. And that makes possible giving each child individual attention, being able to carefully observe and do dynamic assessment, individual pacing, individualized instruction. They make it clear that they expect everybody to succeed. They force the community and consideration for others. They have children teaching and helping one another. Um, they don't have external rewards like stickers or stars. They view learning as reinforcement enough on its own, and therefore we don't need to tempt you to learn by giving you a star or a sticker. Um, their classrooms tend to be more relaxed, happier, less stressful, and they strongly emphasize oral language in the early years. I should mention that this individualized pacing and individualized instruction allows kids to learn the way that own child learns best. And different kids learn better in different ways. And when they're doing the uh, observation and dynamic assessment, they're trying to figure out, why aren't you getting this? If I present it this way, will you get it? If we try it this way, will it work? What helps you? And it's, it's hypothesis testing. It's like what I do. It's trying to figure out what's going on with you so that you succeed. The idea is that you can succeed, and all we have to do is figure out what works with you to enable that to happen. <coughs> Instead of with the starting point that if you failed my test, well, obviously you're a dummy, and let's just move on. The evidence shows that the most successful approach thus far for improving the widest array of executive functions is the martial art Taekwondo. But that's only based on one study, so don't put a lot of, we don't know. There may be a lot of other ways to improve it. Uh, this is the study. Lakes and Hoyt randomly assigned kids in grades kindergarten through grade five, either to Taekwondo or standard phys ed. The children assigned to Taekwondo showed greater gains than children in standard phys ed on all the dimensions of executive function study. This generalized to multiple contexts and was found on multiple measures. Now, traditional martial arts emphasize self-control, discipline, character development. Um, so, for example, you're not supposed to go in there and immediately attack. You're supposed to wait until your opponent presents a good opportunity to, for you. So maybe your opponent is slightly off balance because that your opponent's going to attack you. Now go in and take advantage of his being slightly off balance. So you have to exercise inhibitory control because your first inclination is to go in there. Um, you, uh, uh, it's very much about character development, not so much that we're going to make uh, fighters out of you as we're going to develop wonderful human beings. In a study with adolescent juvenile delinquents, one group was assigned to traditional Taekwondo. The other group was assigned to modern martial arts. Martial arts simply as a physical activity, simply as a competitive sport, nothing about character development, nothing about waiting before you go in and attack. Those in traditional Taekwondo showed less aggression and anxiety, and improved in social ability and self-esteem. Those in modern martial arts showed more juvenile delinquency and aggressiveness, and decreased self-esteem and social ability. So whether gains are seen depends a lot on the way an activity is done. The same activity is called martial arts, 
but it's done in two different ways, and one has benefits and one has drawbacks, okay? So just to say we're doing the same thing isn't enough. You need to see what's happening. Okay, contrary to influential reviews of the benefits of aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise per se, without a cognitive component and maybe without an emotional or social com commitment, such as riding a stationary bike or running on a treadmill, produces n little or no cognitive benefit. Okay, there are lots of claims that it does, but it doesn't. Most disappointing, four studies looked at multiple executive function measures and found no executive function benefit at all on any of them from training regimens of aerobic exercise. For example, one study had overweight eight to 11 year olds do 40 minutes of aerobic exercise every day for 32 weeks and found no improvement in response inhibition or selective attention compared to peers who did sedentary activities like art and board games. Consistent with the disappointing effects of mindless aerobics on executive function is the oft-replicated finding that improvements in aerobic fitness are uncorrelated with cognitive improvements. For example, Katie Davis randomly assigned sedentary overweight 7 to 11 year olds to no treatment or 20 minutes or 40 minutes a day of group aerobic games. The high dose group, the 40 minutes a day, showed the most executive function improvement. The low dose group, 20 minutes a day, improved as much as the high dose group on a treadmill test of endurance. So on the physical test, they looked the same. But the low dose group didn't improve on executive functions significantly more than the no treatment group whereas the high dose group did. So there's a dissociation between the physical improvement and the cognitive improvement. But people who are more physically active have better and have better aerobic fitness, have better executive functions, whether they're kids or they're adults, okay? People who are more physically active and have better aerobic fitness have better executive functions at all ages. So how do you put this together with aerobic interventions do little to improve executive functions or memory and cognitive and physical fitness improvements are uncorrelated? Okay, it seems contradictory. Okay, many people who maintain better fitness do so by participating in physical activities that involve cognitive challenges and complex motor skills. So it might be ultimate frisbee, squash, tennis, rock climbing, soccer, beach volleyball, social dance, and martial arts. It's not simply mindless aerobic activity. Maybe people who freely choose to do aerobic actions enjoy them more than people who are randomly assigned to them. You think? If we get to choose, we like it more than if you force us to do it. There's evidence that any benefit of physical activity for cognition may be proportional to how much joy the physical activity brings. Boring exercise is particularly unlikely to yield cognitive benefits. Indeed, many people who maintain better fitness do so by participating in activities that engage their minds and their hearts and their souls. They may be passionate about these activities and deeply committed to them. These activities may be an important aspect of their social lives and their lives in general and may be an important source of pride and personal identity. It could be that the correlation between better physical and cognitive fitness is due to one or more other variables and not to better fitness per se. Perhaps people who are physically fit have the good sense to eat better or get more sleep, so they tend to be healthier in general. Or maybe causality goes in the opposite direction since one probably needs good executive functions, especially good inhibitory control and discipline, to maintain a regular exercise regimen. At least the evidence so far seems to indicate that it is not the aerobic fitness itself that's causing the cognitive benefit. Results for interventions with more emphasis on motor skills and cognitive demands, more components of sports activities, have been only slightly better than for aerobic exercise or resistance training. Okay, people had great hope 
that if it wasn't mindless aerobics, if it now emphasized more complex motor skills and had more cognitive demands, now you would get executive function improvements. But um, it, it, you're not seeing very much more benefit. So for example, here's a mindless aerobics one. And what you see is, and, and I want to show this because I don't want you to be misled by things you read. So this got published because they claim there's a benefit from the aerobics. But this is the post-test score. This is final performance. The, and the orange is the um, intervention group, and the blue is the wait list. Um, they're almost identical on this test, and they're not significantly different on this test. Um, the way you can tell they're not significantly different is this is your your variation bars. It's telling you how much variation you have on the score. It goes up and down, same distance up is down, okay? And clearly these overlap. This would clearly overlap with that line going down, okay? So there's no significant difference in how they performed at the end. The reason they get to claim that there's a significant benefit is they started out different. So the difference for the intervention group from beginning to end is bigger than the difference for the control group. The difference for the intervention group is bigger than the difference for the control group. But that's just the spurious difference. It's um, you, you, just normal, normal development will have a kid who's a bit behind at eight months catch up at 12 months. That's just normal development. It's not showing a program worked. What you want is to equate the kids at the beginning, show more benefit in your program, and better final scores. If you don't see better final scores, be suspicious of anybody who claims better change, better improvement, okay? And there are lots of examples of this. So this is one where they tried to do the cognitive component, and it was a really well-designed study. So they had high cognitive engagement and high physical exertion. And then they have low cognitive and high physical, etc. So in the high cognitive, high physical, they had team games like fl floorboard and basketball. Uh, both team games required lots of perspective control, complex eye-hand coordination, goal-directed behavior. They combined sports-specific skill with enriched cognitive engagement. For example, they had to learn when a whistle blew, they would switch and do this. And when they saw a card that was green, they did this when the whistle blew. And a card that was red, they did that when a whistle blew. So you would think that they're really working executive functions. Each lesson started with an executive function demanding warm up. So for a game of tag, they might have to keep different rules in mind, react appropriately to cues, inhibit prepotent responses, etc. For a low cognitive engagement and high physical, there was an attempt made to choose exercises that weren't cognitively demanding. The kids would have run a marathon as an entire class. The exercises were chosen so that motivation would be high, but cognitive demand not. They tried to match the team games in the two conditions for physical intensity and amount of social interaction. But both programs lasted a very short time, only six weeks, had only two sessions per week, so the kids had only 12 sessions total in the program. So they, maybe they didn't find much because it was way too short. Um, but what they found, again, is there's no post-test difference. Here's, you want the, these to be low. This is the cost of switching. And there's no, this is the control group. This is the two exercise groups. There's no difference between any of the groups. But what you find is that the control group and the low cognitive demand group started out um, better than the uh, high cognitive demand group. So there's a bigger difference here. Again, they're claiming better improvement, but they're not getting any better at the, at the end, they just happened to start out better, wor worse. Again, you don't want to put a lot of faith in that. You want to see that they come out better. Um, this is another example. Um, 
let me, let me just, uh, I won't go into a lot of detail on it. Uh, so what she's doing is she's comparing uh, aerobic exercise to doing a lot of complex motor skills. Um, and again, what she finds is that um, uh, you're, you're getting better, but you're getting better on everything. And the difference has to do with whether you start out lower or not. This, this study of, of soccer exercise actually found differences. And one reason might be, so this is outcome, the orange group. So now the soccer group looks better than the sedentary group. This is a more difficult executive function task. So one reason they haven't found things might be because they weren't using tasks that really pushed the kids to the limit of what they could do. It was too easy, and so you're seeing similar performance across the kids. Another possibility is that the interventions are too short. But um, I guess I put it a lot later. But I think that they're missing the point. I think what you need is a holistic activity that the kids put their heart and soul into. So they're not doing football exercises. They're not doing six weeks of football. They're doing soccer where they really care about our team and doing well. They're doing whatever it is. They're doing Taekwondo for the whole year and being really committed to their teacher and the activity and really want to be good at it as opposed to isolating things, whether you isolate the cognitive skill in a stupid computerized test, or you isolate the skill in just a simple exercise. I think it's too, too abstracted that what really matters is the kid's commitment, the kid's um, uh, investment in it. To, to be really the best they can be. So they're going to care about getting better, and they're going to really work hard on getting better and take a lot of satisfaction from getting better. Regardless of the program to improve executive functions, a few principles emerge. One is that those with the poorest executive functions always gain the most from any program, whether it's disadvantaged kids or lower income kids or ADHD kids, it doesn't matter. So this I showed you before. This is Clancy Blair and Sibel Raver's results for all the kids in their study. OK, you saw that before. And the top is 0.3, effect size of 0.3, OK? The next slide is going to be exactly the same, but it's um, improvement just for the kids in the schools in the poor neighborhoods, the low-income neighborhoods. OK, now the scale. That's where the top of the other one was, 0.3. The poor kids are, are showing improvements three times greater than the middle class kids. So the kids who are starting more behind on these are benefiting a lot more, regardless of the intervention. Always the kids who are most behind. It's not, sometimes it's not just that they catch up, sometimes they even get better. So small differences at the beginning can lead to bigger and bigger differences over time. Children at risk start school with worse executive functions than more economically advantaged kids, and they fall progressively farther behind each year they're in school. And they become progressively more vulnerable to mental and physical health problems. Since those with initially poorest executive functions always gain the most from any program, improving executive functions early might be an excellent candidate for reducing inequality by improving the executive functions of the most needy kids most, thus heading off gaps in achievement and in health between the more and less advantaged kids. Executive function training appears to transfer, but the transfer is narrow. Computerized working memory training improves working memory, but it doesn't improve anything else like self-control, creativity, or flexibility. So for example, four studies of CogMed administered at least one FAR transfer test to see if something else improved. Only one of them found any evidence of FAR transfer, and the FAR transfer was gone three months later. That is, while CogMed seems quite effective at improving working memory skills at trains, 
benefits don't seem to extend to other cognitive skills. Com com commercial computerized training programs are claiming widespread cognitive benefits. But beware, wide transfer doesn't occur. On the rare occasions where it's been found, those findings haven't been replicated. So you may have heard that Luminosity got sued for claiming widespread cognitive benefits that it just doesn't give you. People improve on the skills they practice, and that transfers to other contexts where those same skills are needed. But people only improve on what they practice. Improvement doesn't transfer to other skills. If improvement in a particular executive function skill is your goal, then you need to have children engage in activities that require and train that skill. To see widespread benefits, diverse skills have to be practiced. Because of that, real-world activities, such as martial arts and certain school curricula, have shown more widespread benefits than targeted computerized training, right? So you're getting narrow transfer to each one. It's just you're training more than one. Three, you can't rest on your laurels. Once practice ends, benefits diminish. Executive function benefits grow smaller as the time since training and practice increases. And it, wouldn't be, it would be unrealistic to expect anything else. If you stopped working out, you wouldn't expect to stay at stop, top fitness forever. You need to keep working on it. Often, benefits are only seen, or are seen most clearly, on outcome measures that push the limits of, of people's executive function. Complex, multi-component measures, like the Wisconsin card sort test, which require multiple executive function skills, are often excellent for distinguishing between groups. But since they require multiple executive function skills, they're not good for isolating the, any particular executive function skills. So I can say this group differs from this on executive function, but I can tell from the complex test on just what aspect of executive function they differ. Executive functions need to be continually challenged to see improvements, not just used, but challenged. This is not only true for executive function training, it applies to all skills at all ages. Erickson spent his whole career looking at what makes for an expert in all kinds of different fields. Dance, chess, all kinds of different things. And what he found was it didn't matter what it was, you need, in order to master it, you need to keep pushing yourself to go beyond your comfort zone, to go in the zone that Vygotsky would call the zone of proximal development, to keep pushing yourself to get better. If you don't keep pushing yourself to get better, you don't get better. Setting aside a time to work on executive functions is less effective than working on executive functions as part and parcel of everything you do. When activities to improve executive functions are embedded in academic activities, it doesn't add yet another activity that teachers need to try to squeeze into their day. And then, all day, every day, the skills are being trained. The time spent practicing them and being challenged to improve is key. Also, whether executive function gains are seen depends on the amount of time spent practicing, working on the skills, pushing yourself to improve. And that's consistent with what Erickson found, regardless of the area, because he found to be truly excellent at something, you need to practice, practice, practice. What he said was 10,000 hours of practice. In any case, it's lots of hours of practice. If the goals of education include logical reasoning, critical thinking, and creative problem solving. We need to give kids opportunities, day in and day out, to solve problems on their own, question assumptions, and reason their way to solutions. And we need to find better ways to assess these skills. Because as you know, what gets assessed is what gets emphasized. Duration matters. It may be that a year or more is needed, rather than just a few weeks or months. Prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain I specialize in, is overrated. To learn something new, we need prefrontal. But after something is no longer new, the people who perform best often recruit prefrontal least. So here's an example. It's actually the DOTS test, the earlier version of Hearts and Flowers. And uh, it activates prefrontal cortex. And some people, it activates it bilaterally on both sides of the brain and some people more on one side, and some people more on the other. 
This is fine. This is normal individual variation. We're good with this, okay? But in two people, it didn't activate prefrontal at all. This is Ruth Brigida and Kathy O'Craven, my colleagues, collaborators on my study. And because they were familiar with the test, prefrontal activation dropped out. When something is new, those who recruit prefrontal most usually perform best. But when you're really good at it, often you're not using prefrontal so much. Okay, think of something um, uh, that was new to you, whether it was adding two plus two or driving a car. In order to be able to do it at the beginning, you need top-down control. You need to think about what you're doing. You need to concentrate. But later on, if you want to be really good at it, you, you let the older areas of the brain take over, and you don't try to exercise so much top-down control. A child may know intellectually, at the level of prefrontal, that he shouldn't hit another. But in the heat of the moment, if that knowledge hasn't become automatic, passed on from prefrontal to older brain regions, the child's going to hit another. Though if you asked, he knows, ex he knows he shouldn't do it, right? A child hits another, and you say, should you hit? And he says, no. He knows. Um, and the older regions of the brain have had much longer to perfect their functioning. So I love to dance, but if I thought about where I'm putting my feet each time, I would totally mess up. I need to let the older areas of the brain take over who can do it so well. But in the beginning, before it hasn't been passed on to those older areas, I have to pay careful attention. I have to pay attention to each step. And then we want the older areas to take over so that you don't have to pay attention to the little bit of addition. You can do the harder math problem by having the easier addition be almost automatic. It's knowing what you should do at an intellectual level, at the level of prefrontal, versus having it be second nature or automatic. The only way something becomes automatic, becomes passed off from prefrontal, is through action, repeated action. Nothing else will do. And Aristotle realized this back in the fourth century BC. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. We don't act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but we rather have these because we've acted rightly. These virtues are formed in a person by doing the actions. We are what we repeatedly do. Hands-on learning. We evolved to be able to learn to help us act, to help us do what we need to do. You learn something when you need it for something you want to do, for a problem you want to solve. So if I asked any of you, who's going to learn a route better, the driver or the passenger in the car? All of you know the answer, and all of you know why. The driver is going to learn the route better because he needs it for driving the car. And the passenger is passively sitting there, so he's not going to pay so much attention to the route. My son gave me a brilliant lecture on how to program the VCR. It was clear, it was elegant, it was gorgeous. A week later, when I went to program the VCR, could I do it? No, because I hadn't paid attention the week earlier with the mindset that I'm ever going to use this. Okay? We all know this. We've known it for at least 20 years. Yet so much of schooling is still not active or hands-on. But instead, students sit passively listening like you guys, right? And the teacher is up here learning the information very well. You're the one using it. The kids need to be using it. Why use only sight, touch, and hearing for learning? We well, have bodies. Have children use their bodies to physically embody or symbolize concepts. That is so powerful and so underutilized. So I'm going to show you a short video. The, um, actually, this is a part from a TED Talk. And the guy in the white shirt and tie actually started something called Dance Your Dissertation. It has people present their dissertations as a dance. But that's not what I'm going to show you right now. This idea came to me while talking to a physicist friend of mine at MIT. He was struggling to explain something to me. A beautiful experiment that uses lasers to cool down matter. Now, he confused me from the very start, because light doesn't cool things down. It makes it hotter. It's happening right now. 
The reason that you can see me standing here is because this room is filled with more than 100 quintillion photons, and they're moving randomly through the space near the speed of light. All of them are different colors. They're rippling with different frequencies, and they're bouncing off every surface, including me, and some of those are flying directly into your eyes, and that's why your brain is forming an image of me standing here. Now, a laser is different. It also uses photons, but they're all synchronized. And if you focus them into a beam, what you have is an incredibly useful tool. The control of a laser is so precise that you can perform surgery inside of an eye. You can use it to store massive amounts of data, and you can use it for this beautiful experiment that my friend was struggling to explain. First, you trap atoms in a special bottle. It uses electromagnetic fields to isolate the atoms from the noise of the environment. And the atoms themselves are quite violent. But if you fire lasers that are precisely tuned to the right frequency, an atom will briefly absorb those photons and tend to slow down. Little by little, it gets colder until eventually it approaches absolute zero. Now, if you use the right kind of atoms and you get them cold enough, something truly bizarre happens. It's no longer a solid, a liquid, or a gas. It enters a new state of matter called a superfluid. The atoms lose their individual identity, and the rules from the quantum world take over. And that's what gives superfluids such spooky properties. For example, if you shine light through a superfluid, it is able to slow photons down to 60 kilometers per hour. Another spooky property is that it flows with absolutely no viscosity or friction. So if you were to take the lid off that bottle, it won't stay inside. A thin film will creep up the inside wall, flow over the top, and right out the outside. Now, of course, the moment that it does hit the outside environment and its temperature rises by even a fraction of a degree, it immediately turns back into normal matter. Superfluids are one of the most fragile things we've ever discovered. And this is the great pleasure of science, the defeat of our intuition through experimentation. Okay, so now I'm going to have you experience it. So, does light travel faster through a solid, a liquid, or a gas? Where, um, uh, for molecules, where are they closer and where are they further away? Where are molecules closest? In a solid? Okay. So you guys stay just like you are. And then they're furthest apart in a gas, right? Liquids in between. Now, what I want is I'm going to whisper something to the first person. You need to whisper it in the ear of the next person, OK? And the last person in the row is to call out the answer, OK? So we're going to play a game of telephone. It has to be whispered directly in the ear of the next person. OK? Start when I say go. One, two, three, go. <laughs> OK, so, sorry, but I didn't take account of hearing problems. <laughs> But what you were supposed to see is, because the molecules are closer in a solid, it's going to get to the last person much faster than in a liquid and slowest in a gas. So um, uh, sound actually travels fastest through the solid, a little bit slower through liquid, and slowest through gas. OK? And people say that 20 years after they've seen this in school, they see the teacher that they learned it from, and they go faster through solid. Because they remember having acted it out, as opposed to just hearing it intellectually. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Kids remember a new word or concept far better if they act it out than if they just hear or read the definition and repeat that out loud. If they've acted it out, they learn it at a much deeper level and remember it longer. It's much harder to motivate yourself when you're just learning to learn, just because somebody said you have to know this for the test, than if you need it for something you want to do. So for example, if, if um, a few subjects get together and have problem-based learning, like working on a car, 
You need to have to read the manual. You need to be able to do the math calculations. And especially, you need science, even though you need other things like uh, motor skills. So that's a context where you need certain skills in order to do what you want to do, which is get this car running. Um, I visited a school that has a farm. And at the farm, for example, in math and science, they said, during the winter, we salt the driveway to the barn. The salt seeps from the driveway onto the ground. So uh, you need to calculate how deep it goes and how wide it goes. And you need to figure out what can grow in salt if the ground is salty. So for example, lettuce is terrible. It won't grow if the soil is salty, but cabbage will. Okay, So this was relevant for work on the farm. It wasn't just abstracted. So I'd like you to think about how you can either separate from your subject, get kids involved in doing it, in exercise, and in um, getting them to work out their ANSIs, or best to have it incorporated with your subject and incorporated with more than just your subject. For example, somebody mentioned at lunch that she has kids compose songs that have to do with the math that they're learning, and then they perform for one another. So they're motivated that their, their little rap song or whatever should, should be good. Their peers are going to see it. So how can you work with the kids so that it's fun and there's a reason? And if you want to get together with other teachers who are at the same level, or with other teachers who teach the same subject, or you want to do it on your own, I don't care. But how can you make it so that there's a reason to learn what you're teaching, and so that it's fun to come to school? They're going to like, they're going to love doing this. OK. It turns out, I mentioned before, that children teaching children produces much better results, often dramatically better results, than us teaching kids. Um, and it's as good for the teacher as it is for the recipient, because the child teaching consolidates and learns the material much better when the child has to teach it. Um, and the recipient is learning from somebody who just recently had the same problems they had. So the child's more likely to understand why the younger child or the other child is having trouble grasping it. Um, and you know that little kids, when they look to a model, they tend to look to the child who's just older, not to us, if they have a choice. Um, the importance of action for learning, learning through doing, especially for little kids. At three to six years of age, children need early education, active hands-on learning play. They do not need early academic instruction. We touched on this earlier today. Young children are not smaller college students. Mm -hmm. Trying to force them to sit still for 10, 20 minutes listening to verbal instruction will cause many of them to dread school and to form long-lasting perceptions of themselves as dumb and unable to learn. Young children's learning needs to be active and hands-on. Many concepts can and should be introduced visually and tactilely before they're introduced using language. It helps a great deal to give children experiences with the concepts first, before attaching verbal labels to them. For example, playing with the pegboards you see, which a three-year-old or a four-year-old might play with, they learn the concepts of height and diameter, even though nobody mentions the word diameter or even height to them. They just, the, uh, the way the pegs are graded. There isn't a difference in color. There isn't a difference in any variable except the variable they want you to tune into. So you're going to see differences in diameter. You're going to notice differences in diameter, even though nobody's telling you the word. So later, when the word gets introduced, you have something to hang it on. It makes much more sense to you now that you've worked with it. And little kids can work with these concepts. They can do a lot of work with fractions in puzzles. Um, and so they learn about half. They learn about a quarter. They learn about triangle. They learn about circle, even though you don't necessarily use those words at all. 
When you have hands-on learning, when they're able to work on their own or in pairs, you get the kinds of things I talked about before. You can give them individual attention without wasting any other child's time because everybody's actively doing their own thing. Um, you can carefully observe, carefully listen to each child. Um, uh, each child can work on what most interests that child. You have individualized instruction and individualized pacing. Each child works on their, at their own pace. Dynamic assessment, which I mentioned before, uses hints and clues to see what is the least amount of help and what kind of help a child needs to advance, probing the child's skills that are on the verge of emer emerging. So I ask you to do something you can't do it. If I give you this little bit of hint, now can you do it? If I give you this kind of hint, can you do it? If I give you a bigger hint, can you do it? What is it that is your problem so that if I address that, now you can do it? And are you almost ready to move on or are you not yet on the verge? Dynamic assessment assesses a child's current skill level as well as the child's readiness to move to a higher level. Instead of traditional assessment where only the child's current competence is assessed. 